Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at another ASIC custom assembly. This is an InFi Maxander modulator driver. It operates at 43 gigabit per second, and it can put out up to 8 volts peak to peak. It's almost certainly made of an indium phosphide process, which NFI used to design a lot of circuits in. InFi doesn't exist anymore. I think it was acquired by Marvell. Now, this is a broken component. As you can see, one of the connectors out here is broken. This is a differential input, differential output amplifier. It's a limiting amplifier, I believe, and it has about maybe 15 to 20 dB of gain. Now, this is pretty old. So by the standard of coherent optics, this would be able to give you a 43 gigabit per second QPSK modulation, which is essentially entirely obsolete. Now we're looking at far, far higher modulation rates and far, far higher data rates. But nonetheless, this should be interesting to take a look inside. These things were quite expensive at the time, and you can see it has a lot of configuration of power voltages and bias plus and minus power supplies, and that's because, again, this is an indium phosphide device and it needs its own custom power supply to go with it. Now, because this is broken, I thought it would be a good opportunity to open it and see how they actually built this driver. At the time, it must have been quite difficult, and putting out 8 volt peak to peak at 43 gigabit per second is still not that trivial, but that's one of the advantages of an indium phosphide process. So let's take it apart and maybe we can look at the dies and see how many ICs there are in there. Maybe it's just a single chip, and I want to see how they transition in and out of these coaxial interfaces. Okay, so I removed the top cover, and of course there's another cover underneath. This needs to be hermetically sealed, I believe. If you look at these, these are V connectors, unsurprisingly, because we, do, we are talking about 43 gigabit per second, so they really wanted to make sure that they preserved as much signal integrity as possible. And here's a broken one, those threads are actually ruined, and that pin is shorter than it should be. So this is definitely not going to go back together, and I removed all the cables as well to make it easier. There's some glue on these screws. As you can see, so definitely not intended to be open, but let's take one more cover off and see what's underneath. Here we are, a single chip solution, so the entire amplifier is in a single die, and we have two ceramic support boards at the top and the bottom, which only have some decoupling capacitors on them, and they essentially wire bond directly to the chip. Now we really need to look at this close, of course, under the microscope to see what's going on, but the design is pretty straightforward. We have coplanar lines coming in, and they come very close to the chip and they become differentially coupled and then there's probably wire bonds going to that and then that's the same for the input and output. Because it does have a differential input, differential output, we can have a completely symmetric package as is the case in this situation. We have tall walls around those lines so when you put the cover on they're really well isolated emulating a coaxial line essentially depending on how close they are to the lid. But pretty straightforward transitions from a microwave point of view but I think the die should be interesting under the microscope. And here's the die under the microscope. This is a 50x magnification. And the die looks really nice. And this pink color is natural to the die. It's not due to some polarization that I'm applying. We can look and see what happens under DIC afterwards. But it has to do with the layers and how they're finished and the gaps of the transparent layers that cause, cause various filtering effect to happen on the light. Now, this is most likely an indium phosphide HPT process, although it is difficult to sometimes tell the difference between an HPT and the hemp process in an indium phosphide back end and front end because it depends on the layout of the particular foundry. And I think this is Infi's own foundry, if I'm not mistaken. And it's kind of cool, you can see Infi's logo here. And this thing was made in 2002. This is old enough to drink here in the United States, 21 years old dyes. So it's quite, quite old. You can appreciate that this was quite ahead of its time back then, obviously intended for research applications at 43 gigabit per second, 21 years ago or so. Now the input, we have a pair of wire bonds on each of the positive and the negative inputs, and that's to reduce the inductance and match it as well as they can. Sometimes you can actually add inductor just for the benefit of increasing the bandwidth in some specific situations, but here they're doing dual. They're not using a ribbon, but the transition is really straightforward, and the output is exactly the same way. Now all of the pads are labeled, which is kind of cool. It helps the person who's wire binding this a lot not to make any mistakes. We do have a couple of the pads that have been tested. You can see that there are probe marks on them, but they're not wire bonded. And that's probably a factory testing. These labeled VCS are probably current source voltage adjustments. And you can see we have one, two, and three. That kind of makes sense because we have one stage, two stage, and three stage amplifier. And this is a fully differential, fully symmetric design. You can see if I draw a line down the middle, the top and the bottom are exactly the same. Now this kind of layout prioritizes high speed performance over matching because half the current source is on the lowest that are at the top and the other half are at the bottom. And that can cause some asymmetry between the two, especially for the loads. And that is a price to pay if you really want to optimize the, the layout. So the middle, the emitters of all these common emitter amplifiers are connected and there doesn't appear to be 
any emitter degeneration, which means this thing is just being at the highest gain they can achieve and fully limiting rail to rail, which helps this bandwidth also quite a bit. And again, this is intended only for QPSK application, so it's not surprising that it is a limiting driver. Now the inputs coming in at the two lines, we do have a section at the input which is also matched, as well as the current source at the input, VCS1 here is actually wire bonded out, and VCS1 on this side is wire bonded out. Now both of these are connected through the middle, the two halves, because this is a, the current source that's common between the two halves of the differential circuit. So I think what they're doing with this VCS1 is that they're probably adjusting the gain by controlling the current in this stage a little bit. For a limiting amplifier, this is not such a big deal because the effect in the linearity isn't so important, but that's probably how they're adjusting the output, unless they're playing with the VDD, which I'm not sure that would be a good idea. I think it's mostly just using the VCS as gain control of the first stage. It's okay for indium phosphide, this is not uncommon. It looks like the VCS2 and VCS3 are not wire bonded out, so they're self-biased. Whatever that you're going to get from them, you're going to get, depending on the value of the VDD and VSS you apply. This is an 8.4 volts and minus 5.2 volt power supply. It requires for it to work, and it burns 3.5 watts. Now, the output is a little bit interesting, too. We should zoom in and take a closer look at it. But it has a very nice, beautiful layout. Now, the top and the bottom of the die, we do have some chip capacitors. So the VDD and the VSS and so on, they jump into this before they jump to the chip. This is just decoupling, nothing unusual going on there. Before we switch the lens, we should take a look at this under polarized light or under DIC. So you can see here that if I adjust, I could create this additional effect on top. Now the 5x magnification, actually DIC doesn't really play a strong role because this lens doesn't really support it anyway at this magnification. You don't really need it. But nonetheless, the effect is interesting. Now if I go to dark field here, a lot of those details are actually gone, but you can appreciate how much gold there is in this <laughs> in this process, as it is common with this indium phosphide and gallium arsenide backends. There's really only w two metal layers, maybe three, that are used, but it looks very different, obviously, under dark field. Let's change the lens. Okay, so at 100 times magnification with the 10x lens, we can see some more details of the output portion. So here's one of the outputs, out one. And we see a long line here, which is clearly an inductor. They're using this inductive behavior of this line in order to do some matching and peaking and extend the frequency. These are quite common techniques. Now here we have from the VDD coming in, we do have some decoupling to a resistor, but then afterwards we have, looks like two HPTs in diode connected configuration and two resistors in series all in parallel going together to the output. I think this combination allows them to make sure that the voltage across the load never drops to zero. And in that situation, you could put too much voltage across this device and destroy the collector. Maybe that's the reason they're doing this. I have to sit and really draw the schematic out. And let me know in the comment section if that's of any interest, because I could sit down and just draw the entire schematic by fiddling around and figuring out what's going on. It will take some time, but if that's of interest, we could consider it. Now, there does seem to be something else in here that is interesting. It looks like we have a, a kind of a transient pins output, because we have an output here going in into the base of another bipolar which is then comes back into the input back again. So this, I wonder if that's either maybe a quasi Cherry Hooper load or a TIA load to extend the bandwidth further. An interesting thing, worth certainly looking at it closer. And then afterwards, the second stage is biased through the first stage. You can see there's some feedback around it. It's a nice design. And if you draw out the schematic, it's not super complicated, but there are some subtle design techniques that go into this to make it work as well as it does. So it's really nice to see. We can bring out some of the additional features here of the die, and particularly various metals that go at the lower metal layers. So for example, these metal layers here that are at the lower layers are quite a bit more obvious. You can't see any of the resistors, which is interesting, probably lower down the layers that we cannot see them. But overall, I really like the layout. It's nice, very, very classic kind of 3.5 layout. If you look at any amplifier in 3.5, they all look very similar because of the limitation of the metallization. You only have so much to work with, so everybody tends to make their layout the same. And lastly here, at a 25x magnification, we can see the transition separating from each other. I did forget to mention that this does have a ground signal, ground signal, ground interface, but only the signals are wire bonded out, so they must have done some uh, careful design to make sure this transition looks good and the bottom of this is grounded, so you do have a nice coplanar going through. So this must have certainly been simulated carefully or at least with experience to know exactly what works and what doesn't work.
and here's a dark field view you can see the epoxy used the silver epoxy to attach those capacitors down to the substrate so we can focus on them and the, normally they use silver epoxy it could also be some solder type thing but generally because these are all done by hand they cure them afterwards you can see some cracks on the surfaces much nicer here in dark field overall very nice you can see with one chip there's a lot you can do and there you have it let me know in the comment section what you think of these videos the format the length as always i'll see you in the comment section